you go back to Iran. You mentioned Iran, Saudi Arabia, Israel, big deal. Iran is not Saudi Arabia when it comes to energy, but they're not nothing. Mm -hmm. Three and a half, four and a half, four million barrels a day of oil. Mm -hmm. They're still selling it, ship to ship transfers, turning off the transponder, mm -hmm. all this sneaky stuff they're doing. Mm -hmm. How does Iran fit into what you just talked about? I think it, the truth of the matter is it's, it's sort of the top of the agenda for the Biden administration as to why it's so critical to get this normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel done. We'd much rather work with the Saudis mm -hmm. uh, than push them towards Russia, Iran, or China. And I think that, frankly, it was a wake-up call when you had the Chinese foreign minister uh, broker the deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The United States has a critical role to play. We want to be the force uh, in the region that our allies can rely on, and we have for decades. And frankly, I think that's one of the biggest reasons we're talking to Saudi Arabia. You know, um, there was an interview with the Crown Prince just last week on another network, and uh, they had a, a, <laughs> a long conversation. Oh, Brett, Brett, did a, Brett did a great job. He really did. He did a great he job. He really did. Brett Baer did a great job interviewing him for an hour, asked him a number of questions. And I think the surprise piece of the interview is he was very direct. He said, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, what will you do? And the Crown Prince said, we'll have to get one, too. He said, I hope we don't have to, because we should all be in the business of preventing Iran from ever having those nuclear ambitions met. And so I think that is honestly the biggest undercurrent that you see and why it's so critical to get this normalization. Let's go into, let's go into China. You, you just referenced Xi Jinping, 2016, Davos. And I've been to China a few times, met some wonderful people. So I want to separate the government of China from the people of China because governments are not mm -hmm. the people. Xi Jinping, what do you think his, if you had to guess, read his mind, which is hard, I'm sure, complicated individual, what do you think he wants globally and economically? You know, it's tough to answer that question. Uh, it's not clear what he wants. I can tell you that in that part of the world they operate on 50 to 100 year plans. Huh. Uh, and so I think he is trying to put in place a plan that will uh, continue to have China on the ascendancy. Even with their, de you think we have bad demographics. China's demographics make us look nice. It's interesting you say that. It depends on your, your definition of demographics. Either it's human capital demographics. Aging. Or it's technology demographics. So let's talk about the technology demographics as we talk about energy transition and the ability to achieve energy transition when 80 to 90 percent of the critical minerals that are refined around the world are refined by China. 80 to 90 percent. Mm -hmm. And if you look at China diplomacy around the world, especially on the continent of Africa, which controls and the source of many of the critical minerals, China's in control. Copper, gallium, Cobalt. Mm -hmm. China is in control of many of those critical minerals. The opportunity exists for us to get involved and invest there through not only economic diplomacy, but diplomacy. So I look at China's position in the supply chain, in the control that they exert today, in the importance of us being able to invest so that we see some of that control. So if I'm in Xi's position today, I speak, I speak about Xi as though I know him personally. I've not ever met him, and so I can't claim that familiarity. But if I think about the hand that he has today, he's got a pretty strong hand. Where now, did he has to be wrong? sensitive. Where did, where, did we, where did we, sorry to interrupt, where did we miss out, Dina? Well, I think... We used to be the biggest lithium producer in the world. Did you know that? Well, America uh, was the biggest lithium producer in the world. North Carolina mine, which Albemarle is now trying to reopen, but... We, we whiffed. Well, to be honest, in a number of industries, right? I mean, we were all surprised during COVID to see that most of our pharmaceuticals were manufactured in China. We we're obviously in the middle of a debate on where our semiconductors and chips are being made. These are huge, huge national security implications beyond uh, the economic issues that, that uh, obviously arise. You know, I think that when I have actually uh, been in the room with Xi Jinping have, uh, when I was deputy national security advisor, mm. and while we can't read his mind, uh, I agree with Ray, there's certainly what we can see publicly what he has said. And in his 
his One Belt, One Road plan, he is seeking to have China be the economic dominant uh, power in the world. They're increasing you know, their, their military platform around the world. And in places like Africa, where, as Ray is saying, there are important minerals, they have a long-term plan, just, just as he says. And I think our plan needs to get a little bit more aggressive right now. We have to actually name them as the competitor that they are. And frankly, what we're doing now with our allies is probably the best set of barriers. So, for example, at the G20, when we announced with India and the UAE and Saudi Arabia a new manufacturing corridor that will take goods and services from uh, India all the way to Europe through the Middle East, which includes new cable lines for faster and more stable cable, cleaner transfer of energy, and of course supplies. And so that is a clear message that we are trying to um, work with our allies to have some you know, uh, uh, checks on China, and certainly what we do in the Indo-Pacific region as well.